This episode includes a discussion of sensitive topics related to mental health and may be activating for some viewers. We encourage you to take care of yourself. For support and resources, visit beam.community backslash get help now. I'm Natalie. I'm Yolo. And this is Black Killing Remix, the podcast. Well, we want to talk about um, depression, right? And I think, you know, I had this experience over the pandemic. Like many of us, we were like, ooh, I need help. I need support. I need resources, right? And so I called my insurance company to be like, hey, I need a new therapist. And I got the good insurance, so connect me with the folks. And they were like, are you depressed? And I was like, I'm Natalie. And I would like a therapist. I'm confused about your line of questioning. And she's like, well, we're only uh, connecting people with therapists who are depressed. And I was like, what about everybody else who has any kind of mental health experience? And also, what about the people who are trying to do preventative care, right? Which I was, I was like, oh, I think I'm beginning to get a little bit overwhelmed with the pandemic. I don't, too much is shifting. I don't know what's going on. And I'm just up in this house, right? And she's like, well, if you're not depressed, then you can't get a therapist. And I was like, well, talk to me about how y'all define depression. And she's like, do you have this, 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 this? And I was like, sure. Maybe those could be factors, right? And she goes, okay, uh, well, then I can connect you with a therapist. And I was like, talk to me about who these therapists are. Is there a way that I can see their profiles? Can I learn about who they are and their kind of perspective um, as therapists? And she was like, no. And I was like, girl, what? And then I said, well, I would like a black therapist. And she said, oh, we don't, um, we don't look at race. That's not a thing that we ask the therapist. And I was like, sis, so here's the thing. You want me to go tell my business to a person that I don't know anything about. And it frankly don't seem like you know much about either. And this is supposed to be a therapeutic intervention when I'm trying to do like preventative care for myself. Um, and that was like a really striking experience to me because I think so many people um, might want support, but the process for getting it is very, very challenging. And so I was not in distress. I was in desire for support. And so I could manage those kind of things. But I was in that process. I was thinking about all of the people who, if they were in distress, what a God awful experience this would be if you are brave enough to ask for help. And then you are met with, you know, I'm sure a really wonderful person on the other end of the phone, but who is not resourced or trained to actually know how to support people who are in distress. And that was really troubling and scary and sad to me. Um, and I'm curious about your experiences um, with depression and kind of how you think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, thank you for sharing that. That's a very distressing experience. And it's also very common for a lot of folks when it comes to accessing therapy. I think it's important to name that as of before I get into my story is that actually uh, therapists, that is not necessarily designed for crisis care. Right. Right. That like you're right. If someone was in high distress calling whatever institution to get that get care through that medium, it's not going to be helpful. No. Right. And so and because um, there is a little bit there's so little analysis and understanding that a part of building what they call the therapeutic alliance, you know, the mm -hmm. relationship between you and a therapist is about their values, is about who they are. Um, unfortunately, many, I feel like in white culture, our dominant culture, it's just kind of perceived that like you can just fill the mold with anybody mm -hmm. as opposed to understand this is a human and a social. And there's so many building. nuances to right. care. Absolutely. But I think that like what happens is like the, the medical establishment tries to like just kind of make it one size fits all. Absolutely. It's an assembly line yes. as opposed to actual tenderness and care absolutely so yeah. that is immediately what kind of struck me and i just think of my and i'm just thinking about how frustrated and angry it makes me because i know that like not only have i navigated that but so many folks i know are trying to get care and it is so difficult mm -hmm. with insurance or without insurance mm -hmm. it is so difficult to get care and that's what we dedicate our work to doing and right? thinking that's about how often in society people say now are saying well you just need a therapist yeah i know and then i go but i think you're underestimating what that process is like and and how challenging that might be for some people and so which is why we have the belief that it takes a variety of care strategies, not just depending on therapy, yeah. because you might, in the meantime, while you're trying to figure out your therapy strategy, you might need to do that yoga. You might need to be at that Reiki artist. You might, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You might need to get a massage. Every once right. There might be other things that you need to do in between 
that process. Absolutely, because treating and supporting any condition isn't just about therapy, right? It has to be, a, this is a societal intervention that has to be done, right? Like, so like, if I'm living with depression, which I am, right? Like, it, like the things that I'm navigating that help support my wellness are not just about this one time a week I'm with someone. Mm. It's about actually my family, my community, the people I have chosen and not chosen who are in my space, right? It's about my home, the access to food, green, all these things influence my capacity to show up in the world, right? Mm. And how I show up in the world. And that sometimes we, uh, when people have all these care strategies, sometimes we name them a diva. Mm. We say, oh, you do a lot, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Not understanding what's actually underneath that, that these are all care strategies, not the frivolousness of like, you know, I have these particular yoga pants and Mm -hmm. I have to drink this kind of, you know, like I think particularly in Los Angeles, right? Like we have this wellness Mm -hmm. culture that kind of, you know, sometimes people think is the same as mental health Mm -hmm. and mental wellness and it sandwiches. And then when someone is like, no, these are my care strategies, actually. Right, right. right. We label them as, you know, having antics and being a diva or being difficult when it's like, no, they're actually trying to really thoughtfully care for themselves. And keep themselves grounded and regulated. Like, I think about all the practices that I engage in in the morning to make sure I start initiate my day in a way that helps me feel grounded, right? I'm doing my meditation. I have my sound bowl. I pull from my oracle deck or my tarot deck, right, for a mess, inspirational message. I have my, my different texts, Buddhist texts, as well as other inspirational books. I like to just pull a random page to get something to get me grounded and rooted because I know that if I rush into my day, I'm just going to be scattered all day. And so I'm trying to figure out how do I start my day with regulation? How do I start my day with peace? What does that look like? And that helps me as a strategy for managing my depression, right? Um, You asked me about my experience, and I want to kind of get into that. Before I get into that, I want to talk about this one piece that I think leads to this conversation I want to have. And it goes back to an experience I had. um, I was somewhere in rural Florida doing a training with Beam, you know, one of our Black Mental Health and Healing Justice trainings, which is training people on how to support other Black folks in crisis. And I'll never forget on the on the um, PowerPoint, we had all the symptoms of depression. Mm. And I'll never forget this young person who might have been like 17 or 18 years old. He rose his hand and he, and he said, you know what, YOLO, this is crazy to me because I thought this just meant being black. Mm. All these things you have on this list, irritability, sleeplessness, low, like low, like low energy, like, you know, rage. He's like, this is like just everybody I know and myself. Mm-hmm. And why I said that's important and it was so powerful to me because it like made me realize in that moment, the symptoms that we call depression are so common in our communities that in many ways they become invisible and normed. Mm -hmm. Like even the irritability and explosiveness, which we talked about in that workshop session, right? How that irritability, we don't always see that as depression. Mm -hmm. We see that as, oh, that's just because, you know, they black and they special, whatever. No, no, no. Actually, there's some other things under And there's there's tremendous life stressors as it relates to living in a black body. Yes, absolutely. That absolutely impact your mental health and your ability to engage the world in the ways in which you might want to. Yes. They cannot be treated. Right. They cannot be treated by just a one-on-one therapy session. When we talk about mental health interventions for Black people in this country, we need to talk about a 360 redevelopment and reimagining of our world. We need to talk about access to health care, preventative health care. We need to talk about living wages. Can I afford my rent? That is an economic stressor. Are the, are the schools my children going to uh, prisons? Are they helping grow them and support them? Do I have, do, am I safe in my neighborhood, right? Is there access to green foods and water? We know that so many of our folks are living in communities where there's food apartheid, mm-hmm. right? And we say food apartheid instead of food deserts because we know apartheid is intentional. Mm-hmm. There are intentionally areas where black folks live where you cannot find grocery stores within miles. And when we use food. words like desert, that implies that there's a natural rhythm. Absolutely. As opposed to an intentional thoughtfulness Absolutely. around abandoning folks, putting them in a place where they will have no access to the necessary resources to be a human being, Absolutely. right? And to be living and breathing and functioning. Absolutely. So that's why for me, it's important to name that like, while therapy is a great intervention to heal our communities, whether it's depression, anxiety, or a variety of conditions, we have to look at holistic interventions Absolutely. that take on all these different dimensions of how is the how is the actual context unwell that's facilitating this condition in a person. And to be real, the thing that I think is so interesting is white folks know this, mm. right? Mm. Because when you look at really affluent and wealthy white folks, they have so many things that support them throughout their navigation of their daily life, Mm. right? 
I do this in the morning. I have this. I do this. Oh, I only like this kind of tea and I do this. And oh, and I tested out a sound, right? There's all this exploration of how to live fully. Mm-hmm. And when I think about our folks, right? Regular, normal folks, right? That ain't part of the, like, oh, you going to start with a sound bowl in the morning. Mm-hmm. Well, how much does the sound bowl cost? Mm-hmm. How am I going to have that, right? And what why my am, kids? And, and my kids got to get to school and I just got off work and I, de- right? There's all these things to navigate. And so, so, so just the one salute, oh, just do this one thing. Yeah. That can't be the answer because we need a whole reframe about what care and support look like in the world. Absolutely. And then even getting to those care strategies in your morning, when you're already in a state of being highly dysregulated and stressed, it's hard to get to the place to create that peace. And if you don't have a community around you that's supporting you with that, right. it can be really difficult to develop the strategy. Even the strategies like I'm going to read my Bible in the morning. For some folks, that can be a very, because they're like, I'm panicking about all the things I have to do today that I feel overwhelmed They already. was anxious last night when right. they went to sleep. So exactly. you're going to wake up and then you miraculously not going to be anxious it's about, the case. no, of course it's, you're going to be anxious. Especially when it's talking about years and years of compounded stress and intergenerational stress. Yes. Right? So I just want to talk about a little bit about you know, my experience living with depression and also struggling with ideations, right? And for people who are watching and listening, when we say ideations, it's thoughts of not wanting to be here, thoughts of wanting to harm yourself, which is very real for a lot of our folks. One of the pieces I want to name that I think is so infuriating to me about the ways in which our mental health industrial complex is built is that literally when I look at the United States, I see all the ways it is designed and built to destroy Black life. Mm. Right. To dehumanize black people. All these systems historically and continually on ongoing. Continue yeah, when we to don't create, interrogate right. the systems. We go, oh, the status quo. Well, this is how it normally happens. Yes. And I go, well, that means it normally is going to continually right. be problematic for black people and people of color generally. Yes. The systems are not designed with any kind of thoughtfulness to the reality of our daily life. Mm-hmm. And because like so what happens the frustrates me about that is that like. These systems are designed to dehumanize us and denigrate us. And then when a black person says, I don't want to be here, I don't feel like I want to be here, the response is incarceration. Yeah. Like when for, for the vast majority of black people in this country, when you call a 911, if you don't have access to crisis units or other kinds of non-police intervention, which they are trying to build, you will have police come to your home. When you said, I'm in crisis in terms of I feel like I'm a threat to myself, they will arrest you. Right. So now I am further traumatized. Yeah, because it's not like the, the the police that show up are trained to support a person in a mental health crisis. That is not what's happening. And even if they were, the, the actual presence of the police blue lights literally has evidence that it triggers anxiety in Black folks. Yes. Because immediately we think, I might be not here anymore. Like, and I'm, also just think about the feeling of when you're driving your car, mm-hmm. if you're a person who drives a car, and you see the lights come on behind you, yep. that immediate drop in the pit of your stomach mm-hmm. where you're like, oh God, because you don't actually know what's going to happen. Yeah. How severe is what's about to happen, yeah. right? And I think about that when you're in the midst of a crisis already mm-hmm. and you call because you need help, yeah. which is why you called. Right. And then someone who, number one, is not trained to help mm-hmm. and also is deeply traumatized themselves Often. shows up. Now we got the perfect training ground for a really horrific moment for multiple humans. Absolutely. And there's some literature that shows that, like, you know, people who are living with mental conditions are, like, 16 times more likely to be killed by the police. Right. So I just want to name that and hold that as I talk about my, going segue into my story, that, like, the systems we have in the United States penalize us for being in distress but produce the distress. Yes. Like literally create. It's literally just victim blaming. And this is also the beef that I have when people talk about the challenges that they're facing. And then our answer is an individual answer. Mm -hmm. And I go, it is not on individuals Mm -hmm. to, you know, this pull yourself up by the bootstraps idea. Like that ain't real. It Mm -hmm. ain't dope. And it ain't help nobody. Right. What does help somebody is when people in positions of power say, I see that this does not work. Yes. And if it does not work for one person. We need to replicate a system where there is never a situation where this happens. And should it, we have protocols in place to rectify, Absolutely. identify, and resolve immediately. Absolutely. That is not the system that we have. That is not the system that we have. 
And so, you know, I, I think about one particular time in which I was struggling with ideation and struggling with wanting to be here, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I think about that moment and what was going through my mind, what was going through my head, what was also experiencing in my real material life, you know? I was on the verge of eviction. I had went to a very prestigious school to study um, social work and realized that this was not for me and felt shame that it wasn't for me. I was in a relationship that um, the narrative I created around the relationship was that I was not enough for this person. And so all of these compounding stress, you know, not having money, all those things created a space for me where I felt so much shame. I felt so... I was so overwhelmed, like literally having the per- the landlord and beating down the door. Like, you know, I was so overwhelmed. And so, and, and, and all the narratives and stories about, you know, where I should be, once again, wherever there should mm. use your shame, like where I should be, who I should be, looking on Instagram and other places and seeing people doing things that I just knew I had no capability and access to do. And feeling this tremendous just grief and sadness and pain. And when I think about it in that moment, Going back to it, because I think about it, and you go back to the moment you think and think about what you were feeling and thinking. And I was like, I realize now it wasn't that I want to die. I just want the pain to stop. Mm. I want to feel less overwhelmed. I want to feel like I feel like I was overwhelmed by this kind of like shadow of this pain and 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 less and not enoughness and all those frameworks, right? And I just wanted to stop. And I didn't see a way out. I didn't see how a friend or family member could help me because no one, nowhere around me seemed safe. It definitely didn't seem safe to call the hotlines. I had seen what happened. It didn't seem safe to call 911. So what would I do, you know? And when I, so when I look back on that situation, I just think I really wanted the pain to stop, but I had no understanding of how to make the pain stop except for to kill myself. Mm. And I think that's the reality for a lot of us that we don't know how to make the pain stop except for to take our lives. Cause it hurts so much. It hurts and it aches like at this place that's like so deep, right? Mm -hmm. So deeply about so much compounded trauma, right? It wasn't just about like, you know, these, this, this like couple of months of things I was navigating. It was like on top of that, all the things I had to navigate as a black queer person, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, that that's something I think about a lot, you know, and like um, how, you know, and being honest, like what happened in that situation was just that I had some friends who felt something was wrong, you know, mm. like emotional. <laughs> um, and that's why community is so important, because I had I had a good friend, several friends who were like, something's up. And, you know, the friend came to my home and found me in a very bad place and stayed with me and was present with me and didn't, she didn't know what to do except for be present with me and hold me, you know? And um, if she had not been there, if they had not come there, I don't know where I'd be. I don't know if I'd be here. And so I, I just say that to say that, like, I know the pain of not wanting to be here. And I know a lot of our folks feel that pain. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, people try to shame or make fun of folks for having that pain. But that pain is real when you've experienced mm-hmm. stuff as a, whether you're Black, you're queer, you're trans, you're a woman, you're navigating all these things and people just expect you to push through. Yep. But that pain is real. But what I have learned that, I, that I'm grateful that I'm here to, to, to know now is that, that I can have folks to help me. Mm. That that knowing now that I want the pain to stop, I do things every day in my life to kind of manage my pain, mm. right? I have to know that. And building a life, like there's something that, um, I can't think of her name right now, uh, Susan Taylor, who's a former um, chief in, chief and editor at large at Essence. She used to have these things called In the Spirit and the Back of Essence Every when I was growing up. And I used to read them a lot. My mom would get Essence. And I remember she said, you have to, there's a quote I used to keep. I used to, cry, I used to keep. Mm. And it says, you have to build your life where everything around you reminds you of how you are loved and how beautiful you are. 
And I remember like seeing that even after the moment coming out of like the ideation and the suicide attempt and being like, my life does not make me feel that way. You know, like nothing about my world reminds me of any, even feels like this even possible. And so I think that what I try to do now is to not only help myself build that world, but also help other folks, particularly our people, <sighs> build into the universe whatever you can, whatever small things. God, I can't stop crying, I'm sorry. Whatever small things are big things that you can to, to make you feel loved and mm -hmm. valued. Because I know that those small things, whether it's your best friend, mm -hmm. whether it's like, you know, your sound bath in the morning, your Bible, your Quran, whatever it is, those small things can be the things that save you. Mm -hmm. I'm like so grateful to witness the after because we know for some of our folks, there is no, the after is our memories of them. Um, and I think about all the things that have been created because of community care, which is what you identify as this was the moment, right? that the homie was like, something is not right. And listened to that. Cause sometimes we know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you go, something ain't right over there mm -hmm. and you don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you dismiss it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just think about what the world would look like if that person dismissed it, right? All of the things that you've created all the people that you've inspired, the new frameworks that you've created that have like shifted culture for people have encouraged them to think about, you know, am I in an environment that feels loving and supportive? That you've been able to create that for so many people. Um, I feel really grateful to like hear your story um, and, and appreciate you being willing to share, knowing that sharing these like deep intimate moments that frankly no one else sees right? That sometimes we, we glaze over those moments because they do elicit the tears. They do elicit all the like messy life stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we want to look a certain way. Um, but what I've come to know is for me, like these are the moments that matter the most to me in the world, right? Because it creates the context for who people are, who they are for real, right? That then when we see behaviors that may not be in alignment with who they want to be all the time, mm -hmm. we can connect back to, ah, there's pain. Yeah. And I think so much of what's happening in the world is that we ignore that each other have pain. Yes. Or we feel like, you know, we should be able to push through or ignore that pain. You know, they call that John Henryism. That's yeah. like a concept to like to frame what we as black folks have been trained to do. Yeah. It's to push through the pain, pretend like the pain doesn't exist. Or when someone says they're in pain, because we deny our pain, we deny theirs too. Yes. And that's why I feel like a big part of what, and I've said this, I've been, you know, I had an opportunity to... Uh, be a part of some work that was working working around the National Suicide Prevention Strategy. And I told them, I was like, look, some of this is that it's not safe for people to talk about how they don't want to be here. Yeah. And because it's not safe and people are afraid of carceral implications, because there is all these incidences where people said that and then next thing you know, they're in an institution where the psychiatrist has so much authority and power. Has all the power. And it abuses that power mm -hmm. and now further traumatizes someone because most people, there's, um, I'm not, not going to remember the exact number, but like there's a large percentage of people who experience being inside a psychiatric institution as another form of trauma that increases their, their suicide. Absolutely. Act. I mean, I mean, it's like, like for a moment, let's like actually think about I'm in crisis. I need support. I get institutionalized. I am in a place that I do not know. I am with people I do not know. I do not know when I will leave. And I don't know what will happen to me in the meantime. Now, when you go, when you having a problem, I know. is that really no. the best thing? It's like when we're scared, we want to feel safe. We want to feel safe. And do you feel supportive. safe in a sterile no. environment no, with strangers? And, you know, an interesting thing happened in the pandemic. 
And oh, I'm about to get emotional about this piece. Um, I'm familiar with what happens with places where people get, you know, different codes, 150, 150, different states have different codes from when you get institutionalized, mm -hmm. right? Um, some people with resources reached out to me about someone who needed uh, support. support. And they asked me about where they could go. And I was like, I don't really know where you would send someone of that caliber or whatever to. Because I was like, I'm used to the, having to send folks to places that I feel very deeply disturbed by and perturbed by or knowing what's out there. Yes. And so what it did, it sent me down this rabbit hole where I started researching, where do the very well-to-do people go when they have mental health crisis? And what does that look like? Well, I'll and tell you I'm what, so, it ain't the same. And I'm so fucking pissed and disgusted at the discrepancy. Oh, yeah. At the the ways in which, like, we know if this happens to most of our folks, where they're going is a place that's going to denigrate them further and destroy and break their spirits. Ain't nobody talking in nice voices. Ain't no juice cleanse. Ain't no green juice. Ain't no green space. Ain't no, we've looked at your medical history and so we know what you're allergic to. And we've created a paleo, vegan, keto, perfect diet for you. None of that is happening. No. And the discrepancy is shocking because what people... When you're, when you're being institutionalized or you're being sent to a psychiatric behavioral health hospital, you're basically in a prison. Like literally the, 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 the vendors that are used in prisons for the different supplies are literally the same vendors because it's the same system that is designed to dehumanize folks, right? To make millions of dollars off of despair. Yep. And so seeing that, you know, so much of my conviction with being and my hope for the work that I want to continue to do in the world, what we want to continue to do in the world, yeah. you know, all of us, is um, building systems that are, like, loving and careful and full of care, mm -hmm. right? Where someone goes through what I went through mm -hmm. and what happens after, and when, and, when some, and when someone comes to support them, like, you're taken to a place that feels loving, that feels easy, that feels caring, that is really listening to you and, and seeing you. I know that's possible because I've seen what the fuck these other people who have money have. Oh, absolutely. And I know what's possible. They get possible. warm blankets and juice clear. I mean, it's like, I'm like, I'm trying to go. Do they have a vacation package? Because I'm trying to go. Listen. It's cute. I like the linens. <laughs> I'm trying to be there. I want the beautiful ching, chime and everything to wake me up anymore. I want all of it, yeah. okay? And we recognize that most folks will never get to experience no. that kind of care unless... We create a world where that is a priority. And where that is a standard. Yes. Where that is it. Well, we start, we stop criminalizing people for being, having conditions and being in distress. That's what, that's what the part, the core of it is, is that so much of Western psychiatry and psychology is pathologizing and shaming people who are not good, able to produce the way we need them to produce. Yes. You can't be a good producer. You can't produce well. Okay. We're going to give you some medicine to fix you so you can produce more. Or we're going to discard you. Yes. That's and essentially I, and, what happens. And what I always say about, and I feel like this is so deeply connected to abolition and prison and all of these things is um, prison and institutionalization does not actually help the human being. No. What it does is removes them from being your problem. Mm, mm, Much like mm. when we throw trash in the garbage can mm. and then we put the barrel on the curb. Now it just, and then the, they come and they take it. And then it just goes to a landfill. Mm -hmm. And when the landfill is too full, they put it in the middle of the ocean. And when it's too full there, they ship it to a country that we don't care about, right? Like, it didn't actually disappear from the planet. I'm confused why humans don't get this at yeah, this point. Yeah. None of this shit disappears yeah. just because we don't like it. Yeah. And so the call is, if we don't like what's going on in the world... What are we going to do about it in our daily lives? Mm -hmm. And if we're so attached to having a Bentley and so attached to being cute, we ain't about to fix nothing yeah. and we're all going to be in shambles and I'm not here for it. You know what I mean? And I think when we sit in community, we realize most of us are not actually here for it. Mm -hmm. We want the world to look different, but are we brave enough to hold a different vision for what's possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the piece. That's the piece. Like... Another world is possible for care, 
for folks living, navigating depression, navigating borderline personality disorder, navigating schizophrenia. And I think it's important to name them because I think that like, one, I understand the tricky relationship that black folks have to diagnosis, diagnosis, excuse me. Like on one hand, you know, when you have a diagnosis, we know these criminal, the criminal legal system will use that against you to further penalize you and harm 100%. you. they would be like, well, she knows she had anxiety as opposed to like, she was in distress. He was, he was navigating pain. That's not used, That's not the framework, right? Yeah. It becomes that piece. And so it, it, it is when people are comfortable enough to say depression, borderline personality, schizophrenia, not only are we taking pushing back against the shame, we're also like recognizing that we're also unfortunately putting ourselves at risk in the system to exploit that against us. Which is why we got to be tricky with diagnosis. We got to be easy with diagnosis. We can't be throwing around diagnosis. Oh, they bipolar. Don't throw that around. Because you don't know what our folks have been through who are living with bipolar in terms of navigating their safety. They're creating love and intimacy for themselves when you use terms like that casually. And I want to say one of the things that we always talk about is that safety is a communal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That each of us, the way we show up, the way we communicate, the way we engage other folks is an indicator of what safety means in a space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you are not contributing yes, come on to the safety, yep. you are contributing to the harm. Yep. And we have to be so clear about that. Mm -hmm. What are you actually doing mm -hmm. to make sure that women are safe? Yep. What are you actually doing to make sure that trans folks are safe, that folks with diagnosis are safe? What are you doing? Because just sitting there mm -hmm. being like, oh, that's not my business. That's mm -hmm. not my... That ain't it. That ain't it. And it's creating a world where everybody feels isolated. Yes. And that's such a big, I mean, that's literally the big part of like our Black Mental Health and Healing Justice peer support training, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when I remember when I when we when we were creating this training together, and the people were like, why would you need that? You know, what would that mean? Like I was like, no, because everyday black folks need to have more skills and tools and resources and understanding about how to support each other and themselves. We, we need, need to, to be able to diagnose, not diagnose, be able to uh, identify yes, yes, yes. what a symptom mm -hmm. of these different things are so that you could go, oh, this actually might be something yes. more meaningful yes. than just so-and-so got an attitude. Right. If exactly. your auntie got an attitude for the last 25 years, yes. she don't just have an attitude. Something's going on. Yes. And so who's going to help her yes. figure out and, and also recognizing that we have a bunch of different tools, right, yeah. to help people figure out, oh, what's the best way to navigate this yeah. and support? That's why that training is so important to me. Like, um, you know, like I said, for folks who are watching and listening, Black Mental Health and Healing Justice Peer Support Training built it 2016, got a lot of naysayers. Um, well, one, we always have naysayers. Naysayers about like first. why, you know, they're like, why are you training barbers? This is before the whole mental health wave we're in now, right? So I'm talking to community activists, big mamas, parents, teachers, coaches, anybody on the street who want to come in. And they were like, this is this doesn't make any sense. And one of my greatest, like, um, one thing I'm really proud of is that we had that, you know, three year evaluation when we hired that firm to really go interview people and say, are you still using this three years later? Is this even helpful? And people saying, this has changed the way I think about things. It is still influencing my life. I'm still using these tools. I'm still trying to hold on to this framework. I read that book you all sent. And that means a lot to me because I know that like, ooh, I'm going to get emotional. I know from the things they share with me that it's, it's having the intended impact of like helping to shift and create more love and healing. Because that's because that's what the end of the day, like, you know, you can call it mental health. You can say mental health, healing, justice. Okay. At the end of the day, my work is to help black people feel more loved, help mm. all of us feel more loved. And I want to just like, you're making me misty eyed. And my makeup is so cute that I just don't. <laughs> I cannot continue to go to the tears. <laughs> However, um, I want to give you your flowers because, you know, you and a group of other folks created these really brilliant uh curriculum that we share into the world with our folks. But I think additionally, um, one of the brilliant things that you did from the beginning with this institution was trust your gut and having a pulse on what our folks needed. And I think that's one half of it, right? But the other piece is, and then you verified and validated that what we were doing was significant statistically right? That we have the receipts that say, actually, the work we're doing is innovative, 
actually does make an impact on the daily lives of the people who come to our trainings and who understand this, and not just from an intellectual perspective, because we also always want folks to be embodied in the things that we're talking about. Absolutely. That it's not just about intellectualizing mental health, but about going, okay, now here's this case study. Mm -hmm. Now, if this were the situation, <laughs> what would you do, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to process through with a group of people to figure out, okay, how do we think about this? And what did we maybe miss? And how could we do this differently? And I think there's so much brilliance in the design of so much of our work and that we're constantly being innovative, which I, you know, I, I obviously get to be a part of thinking about how do we think about this different in a whatever post-pandemic world is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But thinking about how do we continue to, to develop and, and also that we don't have a thought around who a healer is or is not, mm -hmm. that, we're, that we don't discount mm -hmm. The folks in our community who do mm -hmm. heavy lifting Come on now. in terms of stabilizing our community. Absolutely. We recognize that beauticians and barbers Come and on. community activists and the homie around the corner, we recognize that everybody is doing something. I think that's an important piece, Natalie. I'm just really glad that you brought that up. Cause like we like because we all have healing work to do, we all are, we, we when we're all engaged in doing our little part, it doesn't mean that like we all gotta be therapists, right? Honey, everybody it's, don't be a no, therapist. No, don't be a therapist, it's not your job, but it's about like well, in my role as a barber, in my role as a teacher, how do I create space for, for wellness, for, for affirmation, for care, for affirmation of the different ways all the people in my life will show up, for supporting of their boundaries, supporting love? What do I do from where I'm at? Whether I'm the camera person, whether I'm a photographer, whether I'm a gardener, how do I do that? And when we start thinking like that, we're like, oh, now all of a sudden we got a whole village of folks who all are like, oh, bet. You know, you saw Susie? Yeah, let me go check on Susie. Yeah, let me go. We're all now doing this collectively, which is what is ingrained in our DNA as black people. It's as always African what we've folks, done. As a sentence of Africans, right? right? That is a part of who we are. And so it's about, to me, it's about some reclamation of some of our collectivism away from this model that says that only these, you send somebody away to get that done and you ain't responsible, mom, dad, uncle, cousin, whoever, about how you show up mm -hmm. with people, you know? And so um, I just, I, I just, I have a lot of feelings on the topic, but I think it's just so important to say to all our folks and particularly like I'm thinking about now in this moment where so many attacks on trans and queer folks, on trans and queer kids, on uh, so many, you know, black folks, young of all ages who are struggling and want to be here, you know. I really hope, mm, I want you to know that I know what it feels like not to want to be here that there is nothing wrong with feeling like you don't want to be here, that that is a feeling that is legitimate and hard, but real. That what you, that you are not wrong or bad because you can't push through because you ain't got it together right now. That's not, it's nothing's wrong with you. And that there are ways to help alleviate the pain. There are people who, who can support you. There are practices. I just want, our folks to know that. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that. That's we built a whole institution to help our folks know that. And if you're listening to someone, if you have someone in your life that's grappling with that, I want to invite you to think about how you can be more caring and supportive, even if it's just being a listening ear. Some of the most powerful interventions people have done for me around my depression has not been, oh, I came and did CBT and DBT with you. No, no, like wasn't it wasn't those pieces. Those are um interventions, mental health interventions, people who are not familiar. Some of the most powerful interventions I've done, and even I've had said that I've done for other folks that have been like wild, really powerful. I just one, I never forget this one kid in Atlanta, years ago, struggling. And he said, can you come play video games with me and just sit on the porch with me? Because I was really worried about him. And that was against like what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah, the policy was broken. Policy was broken. And you know, like that's what it is what it is, but he's still here. Mm -hmm. We got to break some of these policies and fight against these systems to reimagine care to make sure our folks are good. Because if I had been like, you know what? No, I can't do sit on the porch with you. I can't do that because that's not in my job. Like my job is to support your well-being. So I'm finna suck in Mario Kart for an hour because I am not good at it. I know. I know you were. It wasn't good. 
Because if somebody called me and said, can I play video? I'd be like, ah, damn, I'm about to lose bad. I'm about to lose bad. But I'm going to do it. We're going to be there. Because sometimes you need the presence. And mm-hmm. I get that. And so I want to invite you, if you are supporting someone that you care about, you see someone, to just practice presence, practice listening. And that that in of itself is sometimes so much. And most times enough. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just knowing that somebody will be with us mm-hmm. through the thing. Yeah. And that they will say, I text my best friend this morning and I said, tell me I can do it. Mm. And she said, not only can you do it, ooh, <laughs> not only can you do it, you can do anything you want to do whenever you want to do it. And I just think about like, that's community care, right? It's sometimes just saying, hey, like, I don't, I need something and I don't know what it is. Mm. But will you be with me while I find it? Mm. And like, what if that's the way we showed up with each other? Mm, mm, mm. And so to anyone who's listening, if you are in this moment, because we've been there, we've been there, we've been there. If you are in this moment where you're going, I don't know if I should be here anymore. I want you to know, not only should you be here, you are worthy to be here. That the world is better because you're here. I say. The world is better because you are here. I say. And there are folks working to make this world more livable for us, to make it um, worthy of our presence. I say. Because there is there is so much that our folks deserve mm-hmm. that we don't have. Yeah. And um, and I'm not okay with that. Yeah. I'm not okay with it. So we have been crybabies. I know. We have been the crybabies. I want to say one piece too, because I feel like this comes into play too. And I've I've been in this place where I've struggled. There's this nuance, Natalie, of like sometimes we don't have it to give. Mm. And for me, there are just moments I don't have it to give. And what I've had to do for me is to make space around me to have other people to give, to help people. When I'm like, I can't, I don't have, because sometimes we feel guilt that we can't be all things to all people all the time. And so for me, it's important to build a network as we have done. I don't have it because maybe I'm struggling that day. I don't have it, but here, I'm going to make sure you get to someone who can give it to you, who can support you. That's how we build community care. It's like, you know what? I'm going to drive you down and talk to pastor because I don't have it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to drive you down and talk to big mama because I don't have it, but I, but I care about you. But here's what I could do. This is what I can do. Here's what I can do. Because I may not know how to do that, but maybe I know how to make you a pot of greens. Mm-hmm. And it's about, it's about, can we contribute something? Yes, exactly. That we don't have to have all of the answers. No. We don't have to know all of the things. No, no. But what do we know? Mm-hmm. What do we have? And do we have a willingness to offer it to our community, to folks we love, mm-hmm. with the hope that it can improve something, right? I don't always have to have the answer. No. But I have to have the willingness, I believe, mm-hmm. to be in community, to manage myself in a way that when I see people struggling, I see that as distress, mm. not as attitude, mm. not as rejection. Mm. But that I actually see, ooh, mm. if you showing up this way, ooh, mm. what's happening? Yeah. And that I am a person who people can check in with. Yes. Right? That I am a safe space. That where I am, because I'm there, it is now safer. And I think about what if we all were just 1% more of that? Yeah. yeah. Like we have 1%. Mm. Could we do that? But it's not, you know, I think even safety is one piece of analogy, but I would say one thing that like, you know, being your friend, being your partner, collaborator, (laughs) co-conspirator on many projects. I think that like what I experienced from you is you invite folks to be brighter. Mm. Like you come into space and say, here, look at my light. I want to see what's your light. Show me your light. And it encourages folks. And even when folks are like, I don't want to shine, they're excited. Mm. About the past, because you you give the you you give the invitation to shine, to be bolder, and people need that because sometimes they don't get invited. A lot of people don't get invited. Baby, to shine. sometimes the invitations is dry, <laughs> and I'd be like, "Is there a party? Should we make one? Let's do the thing." 
So that's just one piece is giving you your flowers that you consistently do through your art, through your teaching, through your facilitation, your peer count, all those things that you do is you invite folks to shine. Mm. And, and you invite women, black women to shine. You invite black men to shine, to show up. You invite all of us. Mm. And so I hope you hold that and know that. And that we see you shining. Mm. And that we're like, oh, I want to shine like that. Mm. <laughs> that means so much to me. <laughs> Well, so ooh, this is an, this has been an episode. Um, I'm wondering what affirmations you are thinking. If you have any affirmations to close us out for our time together, mm. I'm thinking about that. I want to continue to affirm that Black people are worthy mm. of perfect conditions, mm. of smooth sailing. Mm-hmm of joy, mm. of peace, of laughter, not because there's pain, but because there's joy. Ashe. Um, Yeah, that's what I want to affirm. Ashe. Whew, I love that. I want to affirm that we get to build what we need Oof. and destroy what we don't, and abolish and let go of what we don't want. Mm. I want to affirm that we have already, as Black people, as African folks across the world, reimagined the world. When they told us that it will never be, the color section will always be there. When they told us that gay folks can never get married. When they told us all these things. And guess what? We said, no, we get to fucking reimagine. And we can fucking do this better than you've done it. Mm. And I tell this to everybody who's struggling with the mental health industrial complex, with these systems. Guess what? We get to reimagine it. We get to tell them that no. We don't get your tired ass, corny ass, empty, pathology-based systems. We're not interested anymore. We can do better. We can be more loving and more imaginative, and we're going to do it together. And the T is, we've been doing it. I say. And so now let's systematize it. I say. I say. Let's stop accepting mediocre things Mm -hmm. when we know what we are actually worthy of. I say. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I love you, too. Y'all don't want to clap. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. I, I, I know Key didn't want to go right into a clap because I just wanted to let it sit. The energy. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Beyond, I'm doing it a disservice just by saying it's powerful. Uh, I'm kind of jumping in because this episode is special to me because I've had moments where I didn't know what I was feeling. You know, like maybe a couple years ago, for the mm. first time, I have a friend that I've lost from mm. suicide. Mm. Uh, I remember calling uh, me and my wife. Now we were separated at the time, but I remember calling her like, "Look, I don't know what I'm feeling right now, and it scares me." Mm. Mm. You know, so uh, this episode was was a good one for me, mm. and I appreciate it. Mm. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is YOLO, and I'm here back again with some more tools that we can use for our healing journey. And this time I want to talk about books. Um, sometimes we may not be ready for therapy or we may not feel comfortable with going to a peer support or healing circle, but books can be a great segue to help us learn about our healing, to learn about wellness, to learn about mental health, and just engage us as we continue to grow. So I have some recommendations here. Our first recommendation is Homecoming. It's by Dr. Tama Bryant. It is a great book for someone who's looking to begin exploring their healing journey. Also have a classic particularly for men and masculine folks, um, The Will to Change, Men, Masculine, and Love by the incomparable Bell Hooks. Check it out. My Grandmother's Hands is a classic. You will find a lot of healers who want to talk about this book. It is a really great opportunity to think about the body, talk about the history of trauma and wellness in our country. It's by Resma Manikam. Definitely recommend this one. And we also have dot, 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 Toronto Burke and Brene Brown's anthology, You Are Your Best Thing, which features a whole plethora of amazing Black authors, activists, and writers, including me. It's a little bit selfish. 
And last but not least, an honorary mention that I only mentioned because this is an exceptional book for those who really want that critical, systematic lens and approach to mental health. Dr. James Davies, who was not a Black person, but wrote a really amazing book called Sedated, How Modern Capitalism Created Our Mental Health Crisis. If you want to go hard, you want to check this book out. These are some of our recommendations. You can find them and more at beam.community.